This is the Digital Factory Podcast. I'm John Bruner. Today we'll be talking about self-assembly and four-dimensional printing. This is a fascinating area that's the result of a lot of advancements in computational design and 3D printing, and it could be a foundational design technology in the very near future. But before we start that discussion, a quick note about the Digital Factory Conference. As many of you already know, it's coming back, this time to Munich. On May 14th, we'll be gathering at the Technical University of Munich to talk about a wide variety of topics that are essential for leaders in digital manufacturing. This is a great program for anyone who manages manufacturing, who's worried about digitization, who's thinking about the next generation of investments that they should make, or anyone who works on the technologies that are at the cutting edge of factory production. We've got speakers like the CTO of GE Europe, the lead on additive manufacturing production at BMW, the head of additive manufacturing at Deutsche Bahn, the CTO of Materialize, the head of IoT and digital supply chain at SAP, and the lead of Deloitte's digital factory practice, as well as a lot of other experts on both the technical and managerial implications of digital manufacturing. To see the program and to register, visit digitalfactory.xyz and make sure you use the code PODCAST for a 10% discount when you register. Again, that's digitalfactory.xyz and use the code PODCAST for a discount. My guest today is Christina Shea. She's Professor of Engineering Design and Computing at ETH Zurich. Christina, it's great to have you on the program. Thank you. Now, you're a leader in this field called 4D printing. What's the fourth dimension that that refers to? 4D printing is uh, about including time or reconfiguration of 3D printed objects after the printing. And the term was actually coined by Skylar Tibbetts at MIT. And there are a number of us working in the field now. So we use 3D printers, uh, often multi-material 3D printers, to print objects. And the time dimension comes in in terms of having an environmental uh, impulse, so say temperature change, uh, but it could also be pressure or even vibration to change or reconfigure the object after printing. And so th- these are uh, shapes then that anticipate some kind of motion um, after they're printed. Yes. So a lot of the work started with anticipating uh, geometric or shape change. And so you design it in such a way that uh, it's printed in one Um, shape. And after, let's say, a temperature change, it converts into a a second shape. And so how do you how do you go about um, designing something like that? Well, uh, in my group, what we do is uh, first we start with understanding the materials. That's the basis. So we have to um, do, for example, if we're using shape memory polymers, we have to understand the glass transition temperature so that we know uh, at what uh, temperature we need to heat the object to change it. Um, So first, understand the materials. Second, to create simulation models uh, so that we can design in a systematic way. And then we design the geometries and simulate the potential changes, uh, either using finite element or uh, dynamic relaxation, which is another type of method. Um, And then we experiment. And so there is quite a bit of trial and error experiment with this as well, so that we um, can design, say, in some of our work, it's uh, bistable structures, so that we design uh, the actuator, and then we integrate them into a configuration and then uh, test them experimentally as well. So is this this a field where these designs um, might be automated or or are becoming automated, or are they really sort of one-off designs that require the the knowledge of a of a skilled researcher so that's the way it used to be um and not too long ago that they were really one-off designs and uh through collaborations and and what we learned in our research is that uh, we could the commercial uh, printer to do this and the materials they offer by understanding materials and even some of our work is using single material and this material can be printed on the cheapest printer there and so now what we're looking at is to look at the computational design aspects of it. So we've already, in all all our different projects, included simulation, um, which can be used uh, also by other people. But now we want to be able to, say, generate a structure 
that can take on different configurations. Hmm. And that, I think, will help people to do it um, without being, you know, a scientist working in the area. Walk us through this generative design process. There are a lot of ideas for how generative design might, uh, might arise and, and, you know, start to create optimized designs, lattices, uh, things like that. In, in the type of generative design for 4D printing that you're describing, is this a kind of uh, genetic algorithm like, like we see with, uh, with lattice design, or is it a different type of generative design? We use a lot of different types of methods. Uh, my background started with uh, what's called grammars, spatial grammars, graph grammars as a way to generate designs. Uh, you could think about these as uh, one of our systems integrates with a CAD system. And so a grammar is a language. And so it's that type of uh, generative system so that you can control uh, the style of design that you get out, whether it's a lattice or in our work, a rollerblade wheel or some other object. Um, and when we do that, then we have a generative part that's using, um, say, a, a grammar, spatial grammar, and then we can link that with optimization. We use a lot of different types of optimization methods. Sometimes we use GAs, uh, but also simulated annealing, pattern search, and gradient-based methods. It really depends on the problem. And so I think with generative design, it's, um, you know, it's not just GAs or just one method, but it's a whole class of, of methods. And it's always about the, what's appropriate for the problem. This, this rollerblade wheel you mentioned, what, what's that? Um, we had a project, uh, you know, sort of reinventing the wheel, literally. <laughs> um, <laughs> to It was the first project we did, actually, with 3D printing. Um, and um, we had... Uh, what we wanted to do is to develop a language of, of wheels that could be 3D printed directly, so no post-processing. And mm. so what we did is in the language of the grammar, we include the constraints of the printer. And in this case, it was a very simple um, fusip position modeling printer. And so we can say, for example, what are the dimensions that we can print? Um, what are the, also, if we have two features next to each other, what are minimum distances or angles between those features? Um, and so with that, what we can do is we generate a whole language of wheels uh, and they can be optimized as well. So they were structurally optimized uh, for load cases. And in this case, we took the rollerblade wheel um, and had two load cases uh, that actually came from ice skating, speed skating, but are relevant also for rollerblading. Hmm. And we demonstrated them in printing both on a simple FDM printer as well as a multi-material uh, polyjet process as well to show that you can have a single object where the outside is a, a rubber-like wheel um, with the inside being more uh, plastic-like uh, design um, that can be customized for the user. This is an interesting design process that you're describing here, and it and it seems to differ in some fundamental ways from traditional, you know, human uh, driven design, where you might start with a concept and then recognize what your limitations are, you know, in in the design space, and then recognize what your limitations are in manufacturing, and you kind of like start with your concept and then refine it as as you consider the limitations. What you're describing here is a a design system where you encompass all of your, you know, requirements and your manufacturing constraints from the very beginning. Is that right? That's correct. The reason that we chose to do it that way is so that uh, we don't uh, have post-processing. So mm -hmm. you could, I mean, there are other people and methods and what they do is they optimize first and then they apply the constraints, but then you're always moving away from your optimized design. So as much as possible, we try to include those in the method and the optimization themselves up front um, so that they're always adhered to. And this is one of, especially from the spatial point of view, this is one of the advantages of a grammar-based system or a spatial grammar um, is being able to encode these spatial relations um, between the objects. So w what do you think are the, the sort of uh, implications for, for design? What do you, when you look at... Um, at a, an object that, uh, that you've designed algorithmically and compare it to something that a, a human designer facing similar constraints might uh, design, what are the differences that become apparent? 
I think one of the big differences is that we can generate a whole number of designs. So once we create mm. the method, say for the rollerblade wheel, we can generate, you know, 10 different designs, 20 different designs. Um, the designer might not like them all, and then they can choose the ones they like and also look at the trade-offs between, say, the designs that are generated, so the, the visual properties, um, compared to the structural performance in this case. And it's this trade-off between, say, engineering or manufacturing performances versus aesthetics or um, uh, the optics of the design that's um, one thing that we can specialize in. Because otherwise, you know, most designers I talk to, they generate a few designs, maybe mm -hmm. three, you know, like we tell our students, minimum three. <laughs> you know, but three is not a lot, especially if you think about 3D printing, because right. the space is so wide open for ge geometry variations, for material variations. So I think it's, it's created us this great playing field uh, for generative design. So the role of the designer might be almost more curatorial rather than actively guiding the process? The designer needs to be involved in the um, formulation of some of the constraints. Mm -hmm. So some can be specific, say, to an additive manufacturing process. Um, but say in the case of these wheels, you know, we put in a certain aesthetics to the system. Um, that was our choice, you know, but uh, another designer would want to put theirs in. And so I think, you know, these systems will never be black box. That's my opinion, because um, there's always going to be something that is case specific to the design they, they want to make. You, you mentioned that uh, your designers were able to describe an aesthetic and, and insert it at the beginning. What does that entail in a, in a system like this? How do you describe an aesthetic uh, to, a, to a generative design algorithm? What we normally do is look at a class of objects. So in this case, you know, it wasn't the first rollerblade wheel. So we can look at um, a class of rollerblade wheel designs. We can also get inspiration from uh, automotive wheel designs or any type of wheel design. Um, so in this case, we have a body of designs that we can start from. You can also do it more generally, though, uh, as well. Um, so it, it really depends on, on what, what's being designed and whether it's visible or not. So, for example, if it's a lot of structure that nobody's going to see, but it needs to look lightweight, then that's a different case. So there it's mm -hmm. really, you know, functional constraints that come in. So mostly around the, the additive manufacturing process. Now, this is fascinating that you could, um, you know, initiate a design process by having the uh, computer sort of examine existing designs. Is that is that uh, what you're suggesting? That's the future of it. Uh, we still do that part by hand, mm -hmm. but that's a that's a future possibility as well to have the computer do it. So in our case, um, we haven't looked in that direction yet. Do you see a future um, in which generative neural networks uh, play a role in this field? Something like a three D version of a generative adversarial network, the type of um, generative network that can like generate images of cats. I think definitely um, that area has come a long way in the past uh, few years, um, and should be relooked at for design applications as well. I think the difference between an image and a design is that the image just has to look right, and the design also has to work. Mm -hmm. um, so most of the things we look at you know, from the wheels to, um, uh, say, soft robots to uh, reconfigurable structures, they're also engineering objects, and so they have to work. And, and that's one of the big differences also in the algorithm side, too, between the, the graphics side versus the engineering side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the really striking thing about a lot of these um, generative algorithms is that they seem to kind of be able to understand human ideas of aesthetic, right? They're, they're able to, you know, the, there's style transfer where you can take, uh, you know, a Van Gogh painting and, and apply the style of the Van Gogh painting onto a photograph. And a human would look at it and say, this is a remarkably perceptive, you know, application of, of Van Gogh's style. But as you say, it's, it's just at the, at the very beginning. And a lot of the things that those networks produce are totally nonsensical. So I imagine that as you, as you look at how you would apply something like that, to three-dimensional, you know, real-world industrial design, it, it probably seems pretty far off. Um, I'm not 
not sure how how far off. I mean, it could be used, for example, for parts of the work we do in terms of developing these generative systems. So the aesthetic side. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, for for functional aspects, I think that's longer away. Let's talk about the the materials. You mentioned that a lot of your work begins with a thorough understanding of the materials that you're using. Um, is, is this an area that's uh, that's progressing rapidly, or are you kind of uh, re-examining a lot of materials that have been around for for a long time? I think it is progressing uh, rapidly. So when we first started with the material testing side about five years ago, um, there were much less papers, especially on the polymer side of 3D printing. So and um, but now there are there are a lot more, and I would hope, even though we could go on with our material testing. Uh, I would hope that at some point we don't need to do as much um, and that also we get better data from the manufacturers as well. The reason we started with it is because um, the data that we could get was so the ranges for, for example, for mechanical properties were large and um, if we optimize it always tunes to the mechanical properties that you give it. And so we wanted to be able to close the loop so that we can automatically generate designs, optimize them, and then test them and have them function as we predicted. And it was with that goal that we that we did that. And I have to say it was um, it was also a great way to understand better the 3D printing process mm-hmm. and how the materials really were being deposited. Hmm. So there's a lot of interest in uh, the way that 3D printed materials compare to the the performance of the same material, you know, fabricated in in traditional processes like injection molding. Um, have you found, uh, you know, really wide uh, variance there? We haven't done those studies in terms of comparisons, um, but I know other people have, and um, they do vary. I mean, the na- the nature of the process is different. You have layers. I mean, the layers are always going to be there in the 3D printing process. And so, for example, in our system, um, we have we did some studies on the anisotropy of the materials. And um, in our cases, you know, we're always going to have that. We just need to know about it mm-hmm. so that we can we can optimize for it. I think that's our. You know, we take the current state of the art as the base. Um, and while I hope it does improve rapidly. Um, you know, we take that as the base and work from there. So it just becomes another constraint in the in the computer model. Exactly. So you've mentioned that you use multi-material printing um, as well. This is a really interesting area because rather than just creating an assembly out of one material, you can create um, assemblies that perhaps move and depend on the, the characteristics of, of different materials together. Could you tell us a bit about uh, what you're doing with multi-material printing? With multi-material printing, uh, again, we start with understanding the different materials. And in our case, we can print, for example, 14 different digital materials at the same time. Mm. And this allows us to do two things. Uh, The first thing is to, for example, in a lattice structure, to vary the elasticity. So we can have a a multi-material lattice structure uh, that's optimized for the members are optimized so that um, they take on the best material properties within what's available. And the second is it's really the enabler for the work we're doing in the 4D printing. Um, And so because we have both soft and hard materials, we can combine them in a single uh, monolithic object so that, for example, we can create a bistable joint in the object in one print. And not only can we do that, but we can tune it. So if we vary the material properties of the joint to make them softer or harder, it means that the force that's required to activate the joint is also uh, less or more. Hmm. And so we create these 40 printed tunable objects through using the different materials in key places. And that's what's allowed us um, to do that work combined with um, I also using the properties of these materials, which happen to be shape memory polymers. So I should add probably that in all this work, there's always a, a programming step as well to these. So in our case, they don't come right out of the printer ready to go, but you need to what's called program them uh, for the activation. You mean program the shape for the activation? Program the, the part? Yes. Yes. I don't mean programming like in a programming language. 
in a computer. Um, but it, what it means is that you deform uh, the shape at a certain temperature so that uh, you can recover that shape uh, when you increase the temperature. Huh. So this is, um, this is in a sense, a, a, a post-processing step to, to yes. prepare it. It's like winding a spring or something. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So you've mentioned movements that are driven by temperature. Are, are there other drivers that you look at in, in these movements? Um, we're also looking at uh, pressure, so pneumatics. And that's another area uh, where I think the multi-material printing is, is very good because we can, again, print, for example, a soft uh, pneumatic actuator connected to a hard, say, plastic-like connector. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have to do as much, say, post-assembly of these objects. So I think the multi-material is really um, one of the big enablers for the 4D printing. It can, 4D printing can be done with a single material as well, um, but the multi-material gives you a lot more options. What's the biggest uh, challenge that you're facing with respect to 3D printing? If you're if you're speaking to the uh, to to some part of the 3D printing industry, what would you uh, what would you ask of it? Better materials, <laughs> as always. I think everybody says the same. We don't typically develop our own materials. We use um, what's there, and they do improve every year. Mm -hmm. But still, I think um, uh, we still need improvements in terms of these materials. For example, reliability and time stability. So mm -hmm. these materials also, um, the ones, uh, especially with the multi-material printing, they change over time. Mm -hmm. So the, the you know, demonstration objects I print today may work in a few months, uh, but they may not do. And so better materials is, is the first. Um, and the second would be uh, more access to the printing process. Mm. So I know some researchers uh, do do it, and it's, and it's possible. And I think um, the more we can make these printers have some, you know, not necessarily totally open, but have some ways to change and modify the process uh, for everybody, uh, the more that we'll get out of them. So you would be able to accomplish more if you had really low-level access to the print head, to the stage, uh, to the temperatures involved and so on? Um, yes. I think we'd start, you know, not with everything, but with a few key things. Uh, but some things are fundamental to the process and the materials. So some things, even with that, you can't get around. So let's talk about uh, applications for this. We've we've gone into the theoretical side quite a bit, but where where do you see uh, 4D printing and, and self assembly uh, getting applied? I think there are a number of areas. So the first is given uh, space grade materials are, for example, space applications. So that's the one of the biggest areas for deployable structures where you also need to make things very lightweight and um, they could be used there. We also look at, for example, in the medical area. I think that's um, a really good area because everything could be customized. So mm -hmm. one of our examples is spinal discs. And we've been looking at a multi-material spinal disc implant design and optimization for that. Again, you know, we have certain limitations with materials and processes, mm -hmm. um, but everybody's different. So imagine a day when, you know, the surgeon can, uh, with a, a generative design system, design a spinal disc implant or some other type of body implant, um, customize it to the patient, uh, print it out and insert it. And hopefully with that, we also would get better fit of these implants and better functional performance. I think the steps are, are starting to be made in this direction by us and, and some others as well. Uh, that would be a great thing to achieve. So you have this incredible opportunity because these are already computationally designed that you could just um, have a very high level process where you go from a measurement of, of some medical need straight through production of an, of an optimized part. Yes, exactly. Um, and it's a great case for, for 3D printing because it should be different for everybody. And in, uh, in, in aerospace, you, you mentioned uh, what kinds of applications do you see? Uh, there, we just started looking in this direction. But um, in deployable structures, you have all the um, structures, for example, on satellites for um, solar panels or for antennas or anything that's on board that after uh, it gets into orbit needs to then deploy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, you know, th there's um, people now build these um, uh, typically by hand. Um, uh, and uh, so that's an area where we could also um, apply our work. 
And the last area is in robotics. That's another area where, where it's moving towards, um, for example, soft robotics that also has applications in biomedical, uh, but just generally in soft robotics. And you can imagine there we can also customize robots for different types of tasks and so on. How do you see the roles of the designer and the engineer and, uh, you know, and other people who are involved in a process like this, like maybe a physician, uh, change as their expertise gets rolled into uh, a single algorithm? There are a lot of different perspectives and, uh, and backgrounds involved in something like what you're describing here. That's true. And this has been one of the big challenges in the area for a while is that, um, you know, for example, if we take the implant example, you know, if we, we, it has to be, um, you know, we have to be very sure and, and it would have to be certified that the design that comes out is, is functional and, um, uh, has certain, uh, certain properties because, you know, it's not like the, the medical professional would look at the simulation, uh, especially. I think everywhere where we have simulation and we have users that are not um, uh, engineers or, or specialized in that area, we have to be very careful and make sure that um, you know we're optimi optimizing within very tight bounds, let's say, so that um, so that we know uh, that what comes out is is uh, functionally. Uh, meets all the performance objectives. It's it, it's it's a fascinating future where where all of these professions are sort of coming together and and one where perhaps it it requires uh, a lot of understanding across the across the professions. As as a as someone with you know an, an engineering background yourself, have you learned a great deal about the kind of the aesthetics of design or the or the kind of related fields in in other applications? as you've had to encompass them in the, in the algorithms you're building? Yes, definitely. Uh, so we develop general methods uh, and apply them in a wide variety of disciplines. And that's uh, one of our challenges all the time, is to really get into uh, what area we're looking into, to understand enough. And, and often we're working with collaborators in that area um, so that, for example, we can embed their knowledge into the generative design algorithms or into the simulation and be able to um, produce realistic objects that, that, and designs that can be used. Um, I think with, with generative design, it, there's a second role. So I've talked mostly about you know, the direct uh, generative design to fabrication. Um, but sometimes it's also used to um, inspire or give people... Uh, professionals in the area, different concepts or different ideas, and that's another another use hmm. uh, as well. But still, we want these um, these objects to be, let's say, to have enough um, uh, knowledge in the the generative design systems to be realistic in the application area where they will be applied. We'll move on now to our recurring segment where I ask our guest about their favorite tool. We have a lot of technical experts on the program, and it's always interesting to hear about some kind of tool that they either depend on or particularly enjoy using. So Christina, what's your favorite tool? I had to think about this. My favorite tool is my laptop. Hmm. Um, I was thinking back to when I was in university and taking a number of computing classes, especially in the first, uh, first and second year, and we were bound to the computer labs back then. And so, you know, to be able to complete your assignments, you had to be in the lab, mm -hmm. um, in the computer lab. And now that's con that, that concept where well, they still exist, computer labs, we have them here too. But a lot of things can be done by the laptop. I mean, I can do almost every, everything from my laptop from, you know, all the office tasks to um, also the, you know, CAD software, final element software, mm -hmm. to networking with our um, high performance computing center. And that's what my students do. And so it is kind of amazing thinking back how much has changed um, and how much we can do even from a laptop and, and then also from your, just from your smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, so you have, especially from a researcher's point of view, it, it's pretty amazing. And it's even the end point, as you suggest, to, um, to a world of millions of powerful uh, cloud computers that can do all of your computation as well. Exactly. Um, and so it really is like we have nearly infinite computing power these days. 
How much do you depend on on having infinite computing power? The the algorithms you're running are they extremely computationally intensive? Uh, they can be, especially uh, the simulation, of course. Mm -hmm. So, for example, one of the big challenges in the smile this example is the number of load cases that have to be considered. And so, if we have, you know, even if we narrow it down to five or six load cases, um, if we want to consider those within the optimization itself. Um, and we have optimization that doesn't lend itself to gradient-based methods, then we have to really find, find ways to reduce the problem. Um, so we're always looking to, um, to reduce it so that it's realistic. I mean, mm -hmm. we have, you know, I have access to a lot of computing power, but if it's something that's going to take, like, let's just say, a week to run, mm -hmm. it means for the researcher, you know, tuning such an algorithm is really difficult. Mm -hmm. And so we do it when we have to, um, but we try to reduce more for that. And then there's the vision. I mean, going back to what we were talking about, designers as the users of these tools, you know, they want everything to run on their laptop somehow, mm -hmm. um, ideally in real time. So, you know, you can, for example, play around parametrically with a model as it's automatically updating everything, you know, say the ladder structure inside. And so, you know, that is the vision. Um, and I think, you know, we make a lot of steps towards that. Also, as you say, with access, say, to cloud, cloud computing, and it's still to come. But everything is, everything is headed in that direction. I think so, yes. It really will depend on, um, you know, practical limitations from a practitioner point of view of what sort of computing power they have access to. And, and a funny one is always um, the number of licenses, for example, they have if we're using simulation. Hmm. Very, very, sometimes, you know, it's very practical things. Right, right. It's incredible what's, what's accessible, though, at, at all from a, a mere laptop. Yes. Christina, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. If listeners want to uh, find your work and learn more about the research you've done, where should they look? Uh, the best is to look at our website, which is uh, www.edac, E-D-A-C, .ethz.ch. Got it. And we'll post that link in the notes that accompany this episode of the podcast as well. Christina Shea, Professor of Engineering, Design, and Computing at ETH Zurich. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks a lot for the discussion. We're all looking forward to Christina's keynote presentation at the Digital Factory Conference on May 14th in Munich. It'll be an essential program for anyone who's interested in the digitization of manufacturing. Beyond additive manufacturing, we'll also be talking about advanced automation, the role of artificial intelligence in the factory, intelligent supply chains, and digital transformation for manufacturers. Remember to register at digitalfactory.xyz using the code PODCAST for a discount. This program was produced by Elise Courier and edited by Inky Stainsworth. For the Digital Factory Podcast, I'm John Bruner.